Good morning. Good morning. The Lord be with you. Today in our worship, both the gospel lesson and the Old Testament lesson refer to the institution of marriage. And in between them, in the epistle lesson, St. Paul expresses the different gifts that are given to people and that they're not all the same. With the institution of marriage, whether we're married or not, it, our Lord uses it to also express to us a relationship, especially in the Old Testament lesson, that we have with Him, our God. St. Paul says in another place in Scripture that when we are married, we become one. And in the Old Testament lesson especially, God refers to the relationship that we have with Him in a loving, expressful way as how it is with a marriage couple when they love each other in marriage. And then the Lord takes delight in marriage in the Gospel lesson when He attended the wedding at Cana and changed the water into wine. Having said that, I'm preaching on the Old Testament lesson today. Normally, we would maybe pick the gospel lesson because it's so familiar, but I thought I'd challenge myself and take the Old Testament lesson today. And so you'll be the judge of how it comes out. For our worship today, the order of worship will be before you. For those online, the worship service will appear online for you. I've been told that some of you use the hymnal, especially for the hymns. So Pastor Morley and I will announce the numbers and the stanzas so that you may quickly turn to it if you're using the hymnal to follow the notes. Our opening hymn is, Just As I Am Without One Plea, it is hymn number 570, and we sing stanzas 1, two, one and 2, 5 and 6. Those in the congregation may remain seated, and we'll have you rise for the invocation the confession of sins and the forgiveness of sins, the absolution. Having said that, we begin with our first hymn.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since you are gathered to hear God's word, to call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. And as an ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, who governs all things in heaven and on earth, mercifully hear the prayers of your people and grant us your peace through all our days. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The 
Old Testament reading for this Sunday is found in the 62nd chapter of the book of Isaiah. And in these verses, God's prophet Isaiah speaks a promise, a promise of deliverance, redemption, and restoration to his lost and exiled people. Hear those words of the Lord. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not be quiet. Until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nation shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken. And your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called, my delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle lesson for this second Sunday after Epiphany is found in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. Here the apostle reminds us that although there are different gifts, there is only one Holy Spirit and one goal for the many and diverse gifts that he showers down upon us. Hear then the scripture. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not, do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, so idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them in all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another, utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We take time now to pause while we listen to an anthem.
Watch the leper, bless the children, love both human and divine. Praise the wisdom of the Father who has spoken through His Son. Speaking still, He calls us to the glory. rise for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John in the second chapter. Glory to you, Lord. In these verses we have recorded for us the first miracle of Jesus at the wedding feast of Cana, where he turned water into wine. John 2, beginning at verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding at Canaan, Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, 
the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Confessing Christians, let us now in our gathering today of worship continue by seeking together the truths of the Christian faith expressed in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, in the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds with the Father and the Son, who with the Father and Son together is worshipped and glorified, who is spoke by the prophets. And I believe in my holy church and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. be seated. Continue now with the hymn of the day of the sermon hymn. Come join in Canaan's feast, which is number 408. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
as I mentioned in the greeting, the word of God that is the basis of the sermon are the words of the Old Testament lesson. I reread, repeat just a couple of verses from the text. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Will you bow your heads in a word of prayer with me? As we praise your holy name today, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for this house of worship where we gather with others to receive your gifts. Even more, we thank you for making your home in our hearts where you work faith and create love that we can share with you and others. Help us to appreciate more and more the life-saving gifts you give to us through holy baptism, your holy supper, and the forgiveness of our sins. Because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and his exodus from the domain of death, we are forgiven and given the promise of a resurrection that cannot be undone. Bring forth songs of thanksgiving from our mouths and allow us now to hear your words for us that we might echo the unspeakable gratitude of love that we have for you. In your name we pray. Amen. Have you ever listened or watched young children at play and noticed that sometimes they give themselves different and new names? Could be a name of a superhero, an athlete, or a character they see on television. Someone whom they can relate to. Sometimes a child may simply choose a name that is not his or her own. Children easily assume roles and can act out different scenarios. And it's a delight to listen and maybe even take part with them at times. Well, there was a girl named Sally. She was five years old. She was in her mother's Sunday school class. And the topic for the lesson for one Sunday was simply entitled, Names. Each of the children was given a choice of a biblical name and told to act out that person how they might be like according to what their name meant. The teacher listed nine names. First one was Abraham. We know Abraham was the father of many. Second name was Tabitha, which means gazelle. Then there was Jonah, and I bet you didn't know what his name meant. A dove. Isaac, full of laughter. Leah was a wild cow. Terah was a goat. And this one was really interesting to me. This one I didn't know. Did you know, according to Genesis 5, verse 29, that Noah means... He took a break. I imagine he took many breaks from building the ark. Tamar was a palm tree. And the last name was Jesus, who meant Savior. Well, there just happened to be nine children in the class. Because Sally's mother was the teacher, Sally certainly was the last one. And guess what name was left at the end? And this was the one her mother thought she would pick because it was the last one left. Jesus. That means Savior. But when her mother asked Sally what name she wanted for herself, thinking she would pick Jesus because it was the last one and the only one left, Sally boasted and pointed out, No, my name is Boss. And in a determined fashion, she started bossing the other children around. (laughs) Telling them where to sit and what to do. Sally, once just the teacher's little girl, 
became the boss. A new name with a new status. Well, today's Old Testament lesson, our sermon text, describes some new names and new statuses for people. A little bit of the background. Children of Israel had just left Babylon after the Babylonian captivity. For almost 70 years, they were captive. And they returned to Jerusalem, to Cana, to the land from which they came. And they thought everything was going to be just like how they left it. But when they got there, how disheartened they became. The walls of Jerusalem were in pieces and crumbled down. Even their place of worship, their temple, was in ruins. You can imagine how disheartened they were. And instead of a renewed national status similar to what they had before, achieved way back under the kings of David and Solomon, the nation was in helpless disarray. Instead of the Lord's leadership and renewal, it appeared to the people that they had been abandoned. So they gave the name of Judah the name Asabah, which in Hebrew means forsaken. And the name for their people in Hebrew, Shemama, which means desolate. Indeed, it was a time of great stress and tension. And this is what led me, in a way, to pick this portion of Scripture to base our sermon upon. We, too, right now, in some ways, are a nation in disarray and stress, are we not? Maybe not for you, but for many people, their lives have changed drastically. Some people have lost their jobs. Some companies have closed, never to start up again. What will things be like when this coronavirus pandemic is over with? There certainly may be some changes that we all will face and all will have to deal with. Well, at this time for the children of Israel of great stress and tension, one can almost hear them taunting the prophet Isaiah. Because you see, the prophet Isaiah made some promises. You, Isaiah, the prophet of the Lord, promised us a glorious return. You promised us that the deaf and the blind and the crippled and the women and children would be gathered together in celebration. Isaiah, you promised that the darkness would be turned to light. And the rough places made smooth. You may recall how John the Baptist repeated this promise of Isaiah. Isaiah, you said it was all part of God's plan to redeem us and restore us to a rightful place among the nations. Well, what now, prophet? We're nothing but a desolate people forsaken, living in a desolate land. Where is God now? Have you ever asked that question or posed that question when you felt you were all alone and that God had forsaken you? When things didn't turn out just the way you thought they would? Or you were stricken down with an illness or a malady that you never in your lifetime felt would come upon you. I have kidly say that in my former parish, one of the shut-ins, I'll never forget, said to me, Pastor, if these are the golden years, they left the gold at the other side of the rainbow. I, in visiting her, never thought that I would be in a predicament like her, 
that I'm involved with with my back now. Some people just give up. But Isaiah the prophet did not. He proclaimed, for Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest. He promised to declare what God had told him to say. And he knew there was a time when God would deliver. To demonstrate this reality, Isaiah said to God's people, You shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will give. Remember the little girl, Sally? The teacher's little girl who called herself the boss. A name that brought her a new status and a new and fresh perspective. The same would be true for the people of Judah and for all of its people. As a bond, Shemama, the Hebrew words became Hephzibah and Beulah, the delight of the Lord, and married. No longer standing alone in the ruins. A new name. A new status. Under God. Got a question for you who are married or who have been married. When you got married, did you see your spouse in sort of rose-colored glasses? When you stood at God's altar and pronounced your vows, did you look at your husband or your wife and pick out their blemishes, their faults? Probably not. But you know, as your marriage continued, some of those blushes, blemishes and faults came to the surface, didn't they? And you know what, for most of us, when those blemishes and spots came about, it only made our love stronger, not weaker. For you know, for so many of us in our marriage, when one spouse is down, the other one is up, and then it switches, doesn't it? And how we build one another up, despite our weaknesses and faults. And help one another. One of the neatest things in my marriage and being a preacher is when my wife constructively criticizes my sermons. One day I gave an object lesson to the kids and I said proudly, don't I look good? Saying to the acolyte and getting ready for worship today, I said, always before you come into worship, Pull down the back of your gown and look in the mirror and go like this. After that children's lesson, my wife said to me back home, you know what, your gown was hiked up in the back and you looked ridiculous. (laughs) And you wondered why the kids were laughing? That's where I learned to do what I told the acolyte. You see, we can make mistakes. We can goof. But now look at it in the relationship that our Lord puts before us in the Old Testament lesson. He says, I, the designer, the builder, will marry you. Well, no, not like we marry our spouse, but he's describing a relationship. He loves us just like a loving spouse loves us. They care for us. They want to help us. They guide us along the way, and don't they? And that's the special thing. Enfold us in their arms and hug us. Some of you I know know German. One day I came home from making calls, and I, my wife was at the sink, and I grabbed her, and I said, Liebchen lips, and she hit me. <laughs> Liebchen means Deer. I was trying to love on her, hug on her, you see. 
And don't we need those hugs at times? And that's what we miss sometimes now, don't we? See, there's a powerful message for us. When everything seems to go wrong or can go wrong in our lives, when our perspective becomes forsaken by others and we think we're forsaken by God, when we can relate to the children of Israel and think our relationships have become desolate and there seems to be no warmth, then we can look to our God and know his promise given to us by the prophet Isaiah. The promise he gives us that he will be there to comfort and assure us at all times. It's pretty cold out there now, isn't it? I read a story the other day back in 1994 in Chicago just like if you're a football fan a couple weeks ago and watched the Green Bay Packers game. Oh, it was cold. And then if you watch the outdoor hockey, annual hockey game, oh my, in Wisconsin. 41 degrees below zero Celsius. And with a wind factor, 59 degrees. I walked my dog last night and had to take off my gloves. Well, you know what I had to do to take off my gloves. And I got home and my hand was numb. I couldn't get that little bag open, you see. It's cold out there. Well, here's my story. Back in 1994 in Chicago, a lady by the name of Victoria Morin, 91 years old, an immigrant from Poland, lived in an apartment, an unheated apartment. When a neighbor called to check on her and could not get a response, she called the police. When the police came, they had to break down their, her door and they found Mrs. Morin kneeling down on her knees, encased in ice, from her near knees down to her lower legs and feet. At first, the police thought she was dead. But a policewoman put her hand on her shoulder and she saw a movement in Mrs. Moran, and Mrs. Moran called out repeatedly in Polish, Oh God, help me. When they got her to the hospital, they treated her for hypothermia, frostbite, and low blood pressure. Few of us, I would dare to say, have suffered from such severity of coldness. But nevertheless, all of us, I believe, at one time or another have thought we were forsaken, alone, and abandoned by everybody including God. Haven't we experienced time when we can say the expression we felt that we were left out in the cold? And sometimes, depending on the circumstances, it can get very worse. But that's when we can listen again to the words of Isaiah. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate. You shall be called by a new name. You are a crown of beauty in the hand of your God. Yes, our God is a God of promise. And our God rejoices over you and me. In our baptism, he has made us his children. He enfolds us in his arms just like a true loving spouse does when they hug and when they love and they care for us. And that can be done in so many ways, can't it? And think of our Lord Jesus, how he loved on us. He destroyed the power of binding chains of abandonment, desolation, and sin. And how did he do it? 
by dying on a cross for you and me. Taking our place that you and I might be called a new name and ever be enfolded in his arms. And yeah, we can't forget his resurrection, can we? That no matter what takes place in this life, there is another life to come. And in that life, there will not be any more sorrow, no more weeping, no more tears, only joy in being in the presence of our God. Yes, you and I have a new status. We are forgiven sinners, children of God, the delight of the Lord. Never let us forget it. Amen. Please rise. Now may the peace of our God, which passes all our understanding, keep us ever strong in our faith and knowing that loving relationship of our Lord and our God. Amen. Pastor Morley will lead us in the prayer of the church. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Gracious Lord God, you manifested your glory in the sign at Canaan. And as you restored creation through the shedding of Christ's blood, pour out your grace in abundance upon us. Give us joy and gladness in the revelation of your truth in the person of your Son. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of glory, preserve your son's bride, the church. Make it her constant joy and delight to preach and hear the good news of forgiveness in her Savior for poor sinners. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of glory, you blessed the wedding at Cana with your presence and honored it with your first miracle. Strengthen and give your gladness to all married couples and their families. Be present in our homes and lives with your free and abundant forgiveness and preserve us in the true faith from each generation to the next. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord of glory, you rule this world by your power. Give to our civil servants respect and recognition of your creation and its nature. When they use the authority given them from above, let it be in accord with your good design for our world and not for the corruption of sin, which they are to rebuke for the good of their citizens. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of glory, we bring before you the sick, distressed, and needy. Especially in this hour, we bring before you Deb Hutt Flutz, Helga Drung, Jenny Block, and Charlotte Scheidel. In addition, dear Lord, as the coronavirus continues to affect so many areas of our country and our world, we implore you, do not let the hearts of your people despair, nor our faith to fail us, but continue to sustain and comfort us. Direct all the efforts that are being done to confront and possibly remedy these situations. And in the meantime, with your merciful hand, attend to those who have been affected by the coronavirus in so many ways. Console the bereaved, protect the helpless, and uplift those who are at this time hospitalized or isolated. Bring hope and healing and relief and restoration to all. Give your abiding comfort in every circumstance that in Christ we shall not die but continue to live and declare his works. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of glory, as you manifested yourself by the sign at Canaan, transforming water into wine, so manifest yourself to us here forming bread and wine to be your very body and blood for the forgiveness of our sins 
and make us fit partakers in repentance and faith. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that of your grace you have instituted holy matrimony in which you keep us from unchastity and other offenses. We implore you, send your blessing on every husband and wife. Do not let them provoke one another to anger and strife, but let them live peaceably together in love and godliness. Strengthen them with your gracious help in all temptations. And help them to rear their children in accordance with your will. Grant us all to walk before you in purity and holiness, putting our trust in you and leading such lives on earth that in the world to come we may have everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Yeah, just a couple of brief announcements. Pastor Astley is on holidays, on vacation. He's returning to the office on Thursday. Uh, both him and myself, even amidst some of the restrictions with the coronavirus that have been put in place, we can't get into some of the nursing homes and hospitals at this time. But we are offering, uh, if you know someone who is hungry and thirsting for Holy Communion and would like private communion, please don't hesitate to tell them to get a hold of us and we can make arrangements either to have private communion here in the church for them or in their home following the guidelines that are before us. In that sense, too, uh, when I was able to get out and make calls more, I was only in the office on Monday mornings and Wednesday mornings. I'm back to being in the office a little more, uh, just about every morning, Monday through Thursday. So just to make you aware, too, of our availabil availability for you. Other than that, uh, this ends the service for our online people as we continue with the sacrament of Holy Communion. Please now rise as we present our offerings to the Lord and we continue with our service of worship here in the church. <laughs> 